life is pretty much out of everybody's control. We make plans in life and God probably looks at you like, yeah, okay. You know, he already has everything set for you. When you go through tough times, you have to know that, you know, you're getting put in these positions for a reason. We may not know those reasons, but that's how I look at a lot of things that, that go on in my life. And I think it kind of makes it easier, even though I think about it all the time. I think it kind of weighs less on my shoulders when I say, you know, I'm gonna just pray about it and whatever God has planned, that's, that's what's gonna happen. It took all of us for, by surprise because I was already in the in the midst of trying to look for a team overseas, you know, what country I was going to want to go to and I signed with the agency and I started, you know, giving her all this information on film and she calls me and we're just trying to, you know, figure out what's going on. And she's like, um, I was doing some research and FIBA has a rule about, you know, headgear or gear that you can wear in the games. And um, we didn't know the exact rule, like this rule just... It was so broad, nobody had it on paper. Nobody could find what it really was saying. So I went ahead and emailed FIBA. This was their first response, was that we try to keep everything religiously neutral. We talked about it like, well, if that's the case, then if they're trying to keep everything religiously neutral, then people who have crosses of tattoos or biblical verses or whatever shouldn't be able to show those. And so I, that's what I wrote back. Probably two weeks later, I got another email back and there, that's when they pulled up this rule. And it said safety reason. Now they went to safety. You know, when you go to safety, you can't really question safety anywhere. Like anybody can say, oh, that's a safety precaution, so no. It's tough, you know. She had to sit out. You take that year off, it's not an ideal scenario. Had she been able to go over there right out of college, there's no doubt that she would have found a home uh, and she would have been able to move up, you know, fairly rapidly, I believe. You know, everybody thinks, yeah, it's just a sport. But it's a place where once you step on the court, you have no other worries. Like you could have the worst things going on in your life. But when I play basketball, I worry about nothing. And I think that's how you know you love the game, when you let nothing affect it. I'm used to warming up on the court, getting ready to play a game. Not being able to be that person anymore, it's just like, well, what can I do to replace that? Right now, I don't know who I am. It's a, sc it's a scary feeling, you know, because I was so used to being a basketball player and I don't know how to handle it. It's just like, Am I anybody without basketball, you know? And it's, it's weird, it's like, am I still myself? You don't know. I don't know how to be normal right now.
probably just doing like a mini clinic, if you want to call it, just to have them do a fun, some fun games, probably. We'll see when they get out here. Make them song. Are you guys ready? Yeah. All right, all right. So come on, I'm just gonna warm you guys up a little bit first. First move is gonna be a crossover. Now the key is to dribble low. You wanna keep the ball below your knees, okay? Like this, cross. Okay? What's the key? The ball has to be where? Your feet. Nice, nice. Okay, go ahead. Good job. It's hard being a young Muslim woman in America. You have to be strong regardless. Like, it, it takes strength to, to walk outside and look different than everybody else. People kind of look at you different. When they see Muslim women, they kind of, they have this, you know, stereotype that they're quiet, that they're submissive, that they're not supposed to do these certain things. And I kind of felt like when I did wear it, when I first started wearing it, I felt like I couldn't be myself. I had to find a way. Come on, somebody make it. Got her, she got her. You're out. Good job, good job. Next person, next person. Shoot it, shoot it. <laughs> good job, good job. Nice, nice. Girl, two in a row. I feel proud of myself. Nice shot, nice shot. <laughs> 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 you know, there was times where I felt like, you know, maybe I should not cover anymore just so I can play. But it's just like, is it worth it? You know, do you want to conform? Right now in this world, I think conforming is one of the worst things you can possibly do. I was going to finish school. I was going to play basketball. I was going to do all this stuff. And now it's just like a huge question mark. Do I want to play for an organization that wasn't letting me play from the start? And, you know, that kind of goes through my head, like, these people don't want me to play in general, so why am I still going at it so hard? And, and you know, eventually, if it does work out, play for them. What, what am I going to end up doing? You did good. You won. You really won. <laughs> good job. Y'all want to play again? Play again? She's willing to fight this fight for the young girls that she's instructing now, those that have this love for basketball, who will not suddenly hit this roadblock. And I think that she understands that they are going to go up against this ban in 10 years, 20 years, if she doesn't do something about it. She has had to question herself and her faith and her future Every aspect of her life, her identity was as a basketball player. What it's done is that it made her reassess everything. Was her love for the game stronger than her faith? Is she really being forced to make a choice? between faith and sport. You know, in talking to people yesterday, basically no one's ever heard of the hijab ban in FIBA. Right. Um, and so even though these are people who are extremely expert in sports, even your fellow athletes, mm -hmm. um, don't have never heard of it before, and they were they were kind of shocked. This has probably cost you your career, and you know, it's turned you into an advocate. So I'm not really nervous because I mean I've I'm just telling my story, and I think at this point, just after hearing the panels yesterday, I think it's important that they see something that's kind of real life. People didn't know about FIBA and hijab and all of this type of stuff. And they were really, like this one woman cried. And so just to see other people like Caucasian, I don't know what religion they may have been, where they're from, the country, like they're affected by it regardless, you know? And so you can see how universal this 
situation is. And that's why I've been saying lately that it's bigger than basketball. The hard part is these federations are, are very difficult to penetrate. It's difficult to find and get access to these people. It's in a sort of elitist, you know, secret society. It does take people um, of power. So people at USA Basketball, if the NBA or the WNBA could get involved, fantastic. That's the kind of change we need. We need people with power. I was uh, on the FIFA executive committee for three years as one of the first few women in the room. In all our searching, we were unable to find a single example of a woman having a headscarf injury playing football. And it took a couple of years, but eventually we succeeded in having the rule changed. Well, I haven't been told I couldn't play because of what I wore, but I was told that I couldn't play on this field because that's fields for the men. I've been told I had to play on, you know, I played on substandard fields, had substandard uniforms, uh, got a handshake for winning the Women's World Cup in 1991. I know what that feels like. It's important that people can see that the game reflects um, the world's population. It's, it's a world game. There's around, I think, around 500 million Muslim women and girls in the world. To me, it's a powerful, symbolic message that you belong. I'm here because I need help. You know, I need help and I need support from government officials, from people uh, at the top of federations. This was way past basketball and FIBA. Like, this is what this whole meeting was about, is human rights. Her testimony inspired the room. She doesn't want anyone else to feel this type of loss and to have, have to find a new way to navigate her life, uh, to figure out what am I going to do if I don't have basketball. The legacy of exclusion that women face in sport is something that will be overcome. It's, it's not a matter of whether, it's just, a, it's just a matter of when and how soon. I would just say one more thing as a message to Bilkies and many more Bilkies who are out there. Sport is a birthright and it should be yours. You should be able to play. aggression, more femininity. We have to value girls more than the looks. The biggest threat is a girl with a book. The system must make room for all that we do. We've been bleeding each month till we gave birth to you. <laughs>